Good morning, everyone. My name is Jen Hicks. I'm the Director of Communications and Outreach with Maine Woodland Owners. Today's program is hosted by Maine Woodland Owners. We are the only statewide organization that supports, provides resources and provides re uh, support for the small woodland owners here in Maine. And today's program is one of the many things that we offer. Um, we have the, um, we are lucky to have today Dave Shabbat. Uh, he is a uh, landowner relations officer with the Maine Warden Service. And he's here to tell everybody a little bit about what he's been seeing these days, uh, working with landowners and land, land users, recreation users on these lands, and um, why things are so busy these days. I guess we can all imagine why. And then he's also here to answer your questions. So I imagine that we have uh, some landowners who may or may not have um, reached out to Dave or his colleague in the past, or, or may have some burning questions. Today's the day to ask those questions and have a nice conversation. Uh, we are a membership organization, so this um, organization works is powered by people like you. So we hope you, if you're not a member, will become one. And I will be. Let me pass it over to Dave. And um, if Dave, did you? How did you want to um, go? Did you want to talk and have people ask questions as you're talking, or would you like to wait till the end to have questions? Um. Probably as uh, towards the end, I'll just give them a little overview of the program, overview of some of the stuff that I've seen lately. And, uh, and then after we can just open it up to, you know, kind of like an open forum type okay. thing and, and uh, see if I can address some issues. Okay, terrific. Well, right. the stage is yours. Thank you again. And uh, Dave Shabbat. Great. Thank you. Again, hi, everybody. And uh, thanks for tuning in. It seems to me like we have a... Uh, uh, a nice amount of people that actually uh, signed on. So I appreciate that. And again, uh, you know, we all have something in common. I'm a landowner myself, uh, my wife and I, and, uh, you know, I understand the importance of owning property and, and uh, allowing access and, and whatnot. So again, I want to thank all the landowners out there and everybody on here that uh, first and foremost, we probably don't say thanks enough. And we appreciate it, whether, whether or not your land's uh, posted or you allow open access, um, we appreciate you and we appreciate, uh, uh, you know, people being able to recreate on your property if you do allow it. So um, this, this year I've been, uh, geez, I've been a game warden oh, full time for 24 and a half years. Um, I first started out up on the Canadian border in a place called Dakwam. So uh, that was my first district. And then as soon as my hometown area came open, which is down uh, in the Green Turner, Lewis and Auburn area, I moved back home and been here ever since. But um, yeah, it's been a, been a great career. Um, I took this promotion to landowner relations back two years ago. Um, the landowner relations program has been in effect in the state for probably um, 25, 26 years. Um, it was very active when it first started under uh, Sergeant Dave Pepper of Maine Warden Service. Um, it then kind of got put on the shelf a little bit um, through, through the years, uh, went under forest service, then it kind of went to um, kind of just kind of got this place. Well, back about seven years ago, they like, well, we got to, we're having so many issues. We need to make sure we're taking care of our landowners. And thank God the state, you know, this, sometimes we don't get everything right, but this, this program is definitely one of those things that we got right. And they gave it back to the warden service. Uh, my co-partner, uh, Rick Laflem um, took it over and uh, back about seven years ago, um, built it, started rebuilding it up, getting it out there, um, quickly realized that it was overwhelming and they put in for a second position with the help of Maine Woodland owners, uh, Maine Farm Bureau, um, large landowners, the advisory board, um, legislators, the general public. Um, legislate they were able to create a second position 
uh, within the Department of IFNW Land Owner Relations. So that came open. I've always been a firm believer um, here in my old district, which was uh, Northern Innisfil County, that my landowners were of the utmost importance to me, and I wanted to make sure, or at least try to make make them happy. Because if they're happy, that means uh, that means people will have a place to recreate. And you know, I personally felt that I could make a difference, so I applied for the job and. I got it. It's been a great, great run here over the last two and a half, almost three years. And uh, it's actually nice to be a little bit of proactive um, as far as law enforcement goes. Um, it's a proactive program where um, I just really have one focus and that's to help Maine's landowners. So I'm um, very proud of that. Very uh, honored to be able to do that. I tried my best. Um, so does Rick and uh, we try to represent you in all different facets, whether it be with the legislature, whether it be on committees. Um, we try to give give our main landowners a voice. So um, with that, um, this year, in all my years of uh, doing this, I've, I've, I've seen, I've never seen so many people outdoors uh, with this whole COVID-19 and the restrictions that have been in place um, really has placed a burden on uh, on Maine's landowners, there's, there's, there's no doubt about it, right? 94% of Maine is privately owned. Here we are, we're telling people to stay home or get outdoors and stay healthy. Well, they took to the outdoors in droves. I mean, un unbelievable. I've never seen so many people outdoors in my life, uh, whether they're hiking, walking, um, ATVing, biking, fishing, hunting. Uh, it was people took to the outdoors. They're still taken to the outdoors. And with that, it put a, uh, a dramatic, uh, just a tremendous amount of pressure on Maine's landowners. Um, we also saw an increase uh, with illegal dumpings. Um, you know, people had more time to be home. And with being home, they were doing more cleaning and getting rid of stuff. Well, I think they found out that a lot of the dumps weren't taking um, certain uh, items and instead of bringing them back home, they went and illegally dumped them. I uh, spent the first oh, part of the spring here um, trying to organize um, big, big illegal dumps, big cleanups. For example, uh, there was down in York County, um, somebody dumped two and a half tons of hydroponic stuff from a uh, marijuana grow. Um, apparently they couldn't get rid of all the materials from the uh, marijuana grow. So they decided to go dump all the soils, roots. Um, it's like a clay material. It's like a potting that holds moisture. Um, anyway, it uh, consisted of two and a half tons of stuff that was illegally dumped off this uh, off this ATV trail and snowmobile trail. Um, myself, along with two other game wardens, uh, we went down there and helped and assisted with that cleanup and got that stuff out of there so that landowner uh, wasn't uh, bothered by having to do that. We, we stepped up and we made sure that the problem went away. So um, that was only, that was only one of them. I mean, there was a uh, three week period. That's all we were doing was organizing and getting uh, areas that uh, people essentially abused and went and dumped. And um, again, I don't want that to be a landowner burden. So we made sure that uh, the program we have uh, part of the landowner relations program is also uh, the keep main clean program. So um, we utilize funding from the Keep Maine Clean program to uh, assist those landowners and remedy their problems. So uh, that was a big, big help to those folks, um, kept the land open and uh, uh, allowed us to, uh, to essentially um, help out when we can, especially when uh, uh, those individuals felt that they, they didn't have a solution. So. It was nice to be able to put a smile on their on their faces. Um, we did see a dramatic increase here 
um, especially once the uh, snow melted in ATV use, even though some of the trails uh, were closed. Uh, we did a, the warden service stepped up and did a dramatic amount of uh, ATV details in order to um, really, really stop that. Uh, what ended up happening is um, ATV growth is dramatic here in the state. It's, uh, it's on a rise. Uh, the way we're registering and people are purchasing, purchasing ATVs, I'll be really surprised if it doesn't surpass um, snowmobile registrations here. Um, you know, we usually register anyways from 80 to 100,000 uh, snowmobiles. Well, we're, we're at least at around that or just a hair below that with ATVs and it keeps growing. Um, you stop by an ATV shop and uh, they can't even keep them in stock. It, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. Um, I have a local ATV dealer down the road here and on any given day you go there and his parking lot is, is full. So people are definitely taking, taking to the woods in a variety of different ways, uh, the ATV use, We've seen increase over the last, oh, 10 years, but over the last five years, and then over the last couple of years dramatically, which kind of spurred, it was time to uh, uh, review um, ATV laws. Um, with that, some of the bigger machines, trail maintenance, I mean, there's a whole variety of different uh, avenues uh, or uh, issues that were uh, being brought up by Maine's landowners. Uh, we discussed them uh, within the Landowner Relations Advisory Board. Um, some recommendations uh, were brought to the legislature. Um, as things started uh, getting hashed out within the legislature, they, uh, uh, everybody quickly realized that uh, this problem um, is much bigger. Um, therefore, the governor actually convened the ATV task force, uh, which consisted of uh, uh, Tom Doak, Maine woodland owners, uh, large landowners, uh, power line, you know, corridor, utility landowners, farm landowners, um, the ATV uh, representatives, landowner relation. I mean, there was there was thirteen of us representing, and uh, we met. Uh, geez, I can't even remember a dozen times. Hashed out some new some new legislation, and uh, looked like it was going pretty good. A um, couple of key things was uh, making sure that if there's an ATV trail on your property, that uh, it was going to be properly uh, maintained. Um, that it was going to be maintained to a standard that's uh, going to benefit you as the landowner. It's going to be uh, better than um, what you expect. Uh, the other thing was, um, you know, the size uh, of an ATV, not to exceed 65 inches and, and or 2,000 pounds. So we, we, had a, we had a width and a weight restriction. Um, there was a couple other parts of the law that was sitting in committee. Well, COVID-19 happened, and before anything can get passed, it uh, um, kind of is sitting in limbo. So kind of anxious for the legislature to get back to, to A, get some funding for the trails, to start implementing some of the stuff and recommendations that the ATV task force came out with, um, and uh, that way we can get, start getting something on the ground to uh, benefit our landowners that are graciously uh, allowing this type of use on their property. So that's sitting in the legislature right now. Everything's kind of in limbo with that. Um, I wish it was a lot more, uh, <laughs> I, wish, I wish things worked a lot faster than what they are, but um, hopefully we can get that through when the legislature um, comes, comes back in session. So, um, as, as that uh, goes on, I, uh, I would suggest uh, making contact with your legislatures and stuff um, as those bills are coming forth and making sure that, uh, kind of give your opinion. Make sure you keep involved in the legislative process. I think that's one of the more important parts for Maine's uh, landowners.
to participate in, whether you're a landowner or even a person that participates in the outdoors. Um, it's one of those things that uh, um, folks don't don't really participate in. I don't know why they they go and vote, but at that point they seem to drop the ball and never follow through and keep in contact with these folks because it's very important that your voice be heard on um, throughout the year, not just one time during the vote. So um, again, I could I could talk forever but I wanna make sure that I have some interaction with you folks as well and answer any of those questions. So um, why don't we open it up to having some questions, Jen, and, and, and seeing what the folks are experiencing out there and um, to see if it kind of coincides with what, what we've been seeing on the ground and what we're trying to deal with, you know, it helps us with uh, enforcement and direction. Does anybody have any questions? You can type them in the chat area or just go ahead and jump in here. We also have Tom Doak here. Tom, did you have anything you wanted to, to add or anything you're experiencing? Or well, I was gonna, I thought, I thought Dave's uh, county was pretty interesting. I think, I think we're hearing from a lot of folks about, gee, there's a lot of people on my land all of a sudden. So I appreciate Dave, your comments and Actually, Dave, I appreciate, as you know, I appreciate all the great work you do for landowners. And I would say working with Dave a lot, Dave sir, and, and Rick and frankly, the Wooden Service, they have done a great job, frankly, working with landowners and showing up and helping those landowners. So it's been very good. Um, Dave, can you explain if someone has a problem, what uh, what the steps would be or, you know, so, so someone's having a problem and um, what should they then do? you know, um, someone's misusing their land or they have somebody there they don't want or whatever, just some problem. What what happens, what should they be doing? Yeah, no, great, Tom, thank you. They said you're able to, thanks for that question because you're able to kind of steer me in the uh, right directions here, of kind of the key points that I wanted to talk about today. Um, first and foremost, if you have a um, local police department, um, those police departments don't necessarily know about our, some do, some don't, depending on how, even though we try to get the word out to everybody, right? That, that's part of our proactiveness is we've been able to, uh, we want to get out to municipalities um, and get them to know that we exist as a program. And I'll give an example. Auburn PD knows that we exist. Um, they had a landowner that was calling up with some landowner issues. Um, they actually referred that landowner to me and I was able to uh, solve that gentleman's problems. And it, it, it was a great, great partnership, right? I was able to um, go in and, and take care of this guy's problem. This, this gentleman owns 800 acres in the town of, in the city of Auburn. Um, he had somebody uh, going in there and essentially illegally cut a walking path a mile long walking path through the center of his uh, wood lot and painted it with uh, orange dots or red dots. He didn't, <laughs> he had no idea who this was. So we ended up uh, setting up game cameras throughout his property, um, kind of pinned down when this individual was coming and going in a time frame. And uh, I had two game wardens sit there and wait for the individual and they were after able to apprehend the individual on a Sunday walking around with a, uh, a pellet gun, which is still considered a firearm. And he was uh, shooting stuff just as he saw it. And he admitted to cutting the trail and, and, and essentially illegally hunting. So um, why this individual decided to do that? It's not your average kid. This man was in his 60s and for some reason, wanted to play, found this place, thought it was pretty and wanted to walk, make a walking path and didn't even consider whether or not somebody owned it. So there is some ignorance out there that is kind of mind boggling. Um, but uh, first and foremost, if you have an issue re relating to landowner relations, you can contact me directly via uh, main IF and W. Um, you can go right on there uh, or you can email me directly, but my email, my cell phone number is right on our website. And so is uh, my partner, Rick with Lems. 
first and foremost, I don't want my landowners in Maine to have to jump through all these hoops to try to get in touch with me. So, you know, usually if you need your district game warden, you contact the state police barracks. They dispatch for us. So whatever region, uh, whether it be Holton, Bangor, or Augusta, those are the three state police barracks. That's how you get in touch with the local game warden. Uh, but again, if you just want to speak to the landowner relations guy, um, you know, my email is dave.shabbat at main.gov and you feel free to email me. Um, Rick and I work both Monday through Friday. So therefore, if it's an emergency or an ongoing issue right then and there, I would suggest contact your local state police barracks. They'll dispatch a game warden. Our warden service and our game wardens are uh, uh, trained and they know that landowner relations is, uh, it's a priority within our department. All right, Maine's Fish and Wildlife, uh, that's why we were created. Well, guess what? Without our landowners, we can't manage our Maine's Fish and Wildlife and people won't have a place to recreate. So guess what? We finally got buy-in from everybody in our department, buy-in from our biologists, buy-in from our warden service, and uh, they understand the expectation Rick and I have, and that comes from our commissioner, the governor, our colonel, all the way down through the ranks, that our landowners, um, they're calling. We need to make sure we're calling them back and addressing any of their needs. So. Uh, the state police barracks, if it's emergency or on the weekend, or you can email me, or like I said, Maine, IFNW, um, go under the tab, landowner relations under programs, and my uh, cell phone number is right there as well. So um, I have no problem. I, I like that interaction, and I always want to make myself available to uh, Maine's landowners. So that's why we make it easy for you so you don't have so many hoops to jump through. Also, um, kind of to expand upon this, we have a great, as a department, we uh, do a great job with uh, being able to send emails, being able to have interaction with, you know, our people that hunt, our people that fish, people that snowmobile, boat, um, ATV. We're able to gather their information very, very easily um, and get messages out to them via social media or mailings or any of that stuff, but we do have a hard time um, getting that same messaging to our, our landowners. So we just started uh, this year um, with rink advertising. Uh, we put a substantial amount of money into this, trying to reach um, different groups, uh, our non-traditional users, the hikers, uh, the people, the dog walkers, and our landowners. So if you somehow Googled, you know, something relating to a tractor or something like that, um, it's now looking at those type of logarithms out in the social media world. And you might mysteriously see, hey, my main IFNW and how to be a good land user or uh, things you can do, information regarding landowners. So that's on our website as well. Um, there's a spot for people to sign up so that they can receive our emails. There's a spot for folks to sign up to be volunteers to help landowners. Uh, believe it or not, I just, uh, we just had a dozen or more people sign up here recently as volunteers to the Outdoor Partners Program. So it's something new that we're trying and we actually have people interacting and engaging and giving us their information, wanting to help Maine's landowners. So um, I'm anxious to see if that list continues to grow. So we're trying a variety of different uh, ways to uh, reach all user groups. But I, me personally, I think we've been lacking on uh, the interaction um, or informational things to Maine landowners. That's why I try to do as many of these um, meetings, face-to-face -face stuff, whether it be with the Farm Bureau or uh, Maine Woodland owners or uh, attending Maine forestry events. I try to make people aware that this program exists because it's nothing but a benefit to Maine's landowners. And uh, granted, there's only two of us, but there's two of us that are dedicated to it. 
So, what else do we got up there? This is Richard Nass. Uh, the, we're fortunate. I live in Acton. We have 135 acres right on the, the border. And we're very fortunate that we've been landowners for a long time. We've never had any dumping prop, dumping stuff on the property or too much trouble with land. But I have a couple of things. One, we're not hunters and we, and we, but we're not posted to landing. So we encourage people to hunt and to use the land. It's, it's a beautiful piece of land. So uh, a year or so ago, a neighbor contacts us, has a friend that wants to hunt in our land. So he said, fine, our only condition was let us know when you're out there. So that never happened. All of a sudden, uh, one day I find a game camera out. And I just, by chance, I happened to be cutting a dead tree down and just attached to a tree next to it. I took the game camera down. I didn't know how to use it. I didn't know who it belonged to. Uh, finally, I found a hunter that basically was able to show us the pictures that were on it. Uh, and uh, so that became, you know, for non-hunters, that became an issue. And then we find out that he's installed the tree stand out there uh, before. And then finally we met him, basically, and we got all that stuff straightened out. Uh, but I, just to, to show you that there's, uh, on the part of the landowners, there's sometimes the lack of information. You give somebody permission to hunt, you don't know what, what conditions to set up, what you want. Sometimes we don't even know what we want. Uh, for instance, my wife and I disagreed on the tree stand. I was okay with the tree stand, she wasn't. So we had this argument going on about tree stands. Anyway, I just wanted to see if you had any comments about that. There's, as I said, we've been fortunate, but uh, uh, sometimes things get out of control pretty quickly. Mr. Ness, that, that's great. And uh, believe it or not, that's the type of information. Um, again, there are several landowners like yourselves that, uh, you know, they own the property, but they don't hunt and therefore don't know the questions to ask. And that's the very information I want to get out to Maine's landowners to say, hey, if somebody does approach you to uh, come hunting, uh, these are the key questions you should ask them. Are you using, because unfortunately, even though we have hunter safety courses and, and all that, we're doing a lot better job with educating our hunters there are still some hunters we never got in contact with, you know, that are in their 50s and, and 60s or even late 40s um, that haven't had this updated education where, hey, if you ask for permission from a landowner, that's permission for yourself, not for you and 10 of your buddies. Also, if you're putting a tree stand up, just because you ask permission, make sure you explain to the landowner that you are going to use a tree stand or that you put up, want to put out a game camera. Um, that's the very information that I want to get out to Maine's landowners is, hey, you know what, if somebody does ask, if they don't ask you, then these are a couple follow-up questions that you might want to say, hey, are you using a tree stand? How about a game camera? Are you going to have a game? I don't want a game camera up. Or, you know, I have, I have a woman in, uh, in Turner. Uh, she owns 250 acres, fabulous lady. Well, she really took offense. She gave these two gentlemen, two bow hunters, uh, permission. And uh, this is before the game camera law came out. So now there's a law in the book saying that everybody, they have to have your permission to put a trail camera out. So they need to specifically, and the same thing with a tree stand. They need a specific, just because you gave them permission to hunt does not necessarily mean they have the right to put out um put out the camera or put out a tree stand. So uh, first and foremost, that should fall back onto the hunter um, and it does. So we wanna make sure that uh, that's clear. You, just cause you gave permission, a lot of, a lot of this onus and uh, always falls back on the individual recreating. But again, I wanna make sure Maine's landowners are educated in that as well because education is where that, uh, you know, where we, can keep open communication, which is probably the most important thing. But she saw those game cameras and she felt just like you, wow, this is an invasion of my privacy and I don't want this. So um, she reached out to me, we made contact and, you know, the following year that game camera law actually came into effect. So um, I think that's been very, very uh, beneficial. Um, definitely from a law enforcement, 
point, it's been beneficial because it makes uh, makes things easier to, hey, did you give them permission to use a camera? No, perfect. We take it as contraband. We then get a, uh, believe it or not, we have to apply for a search warrant so that I can view those pictures <laughs> that are on that camera, even though they're out on your property. So um, it's not a problem. It's a pretty basic thing where we uh, get a search warrant, we then review it, and we usually can uh, find out who the individual is once you do find a camera on your property. But um, we utilize cameras all the time to help landowners solve their issues. We, uh, we ask you for permission because I need to ask you for permission as well as a, as a law enforcement officer. So I'll say, hey, I want to put out some cameras. Do I have your permission? You say yes. We then catch the individuals uh, causing the problems. So, um, but Mr. Nass, that's, that's the type of information I actually, uh, I'm going to refer to my, uh, I'm going to give it to my information education department, see if we can continue that push to our main landowners to get that type of stuff out. Hey, as a landowner, these are the type of things you should consider asking if somebody wants to recreate on your property. So thank you for bringing that up. That just re really uh, reaffirms that kind of the direction that we're going with this program. Who else has a question for Dave? Dave, uh, Tom Doak, I would add to that um, probably the idea of cutting trees because uh, I've had some, you know, we've had some issues where you get permission and you're right, you, you gave permission, you didn't get permission for tree stands and cameras, but there's a, I think hunters need to know that permission doesn't guarantee that, but also we've had some landowners that have had, you know, cutting lanes cut, or trees cut um, by people hunting. And uh, then, you know, probably a little work with the hunters on that the same way or reminding a landowner, you're not giving, you know, you don't tell them, and, uh, but I don't expect you to cut any of my trees it, well, if, you're, if you're hunting kind of thing, because we see that happen at times. Yes, you're right, Tom. And that's another thing, even though it's explained in our law book that a person doesn't have a right to cut somebody's tree down, they still do cut those cutting lanes. And that's... Uh, yeah. Thank you, Tom, for bringing that up. That's another note I'll, I'll make here. Um, Tom, as, as, a, uh, as the board, the advisory board there, we're going to have to see if we can make sure that we add branches to that because that's what we, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, we're dealing with that with this whole Auburn thing where the district attorney's interpretation of the law is a little bit different than what, what the intent of the law is. So. Yeah. Little little tweaks that every time they come up, we kind of have to fix those loopholes. So, thanks for bringing that. The, that the other up question well. you you brought up something about a search warrant. If you if you find a camera um, that someone has placed there not legally, you you can't look at the pictures without a search warrant. Is that what you said? No, saying? I can't have the landowner. But the <laughs> landowner can actually, if the landowner has to operate the camera, it's on their land. They can. The nothing that would stop that landowner from picking that camera up and looking at the photos. Right, they're legally, but I'm not able to ask the landowner to do that. But if the landowner does that and sends you the photos, look what I found on the camera on my land, then you, I assume. As long as I am not the one <laughs> asking and telling you to do that, then yes, that would be fine. The other question but... I get from time to time um, is uh, someone finds a tree stand or a camera. Yep. Uh, I mean, it's easier to find the tree stand, obviously, than a camera. And um, what should I do? And, um, you know, I, I frankly, I've owned my land. I've, t I, I've owned a lot of, I've owned a lot of tree stands that didn't belong to me because I just simply yes. take them and nobody ever calls me. But what, what do you suggest when someone finds that? Yeah. Finds well, like that? What ends up happening, Tom, is um, usually they'll either reach out to myself or 90% of the time the district game warden. And what we're going to ask you is say, listen, do you want the person apprehended? If you want the person apprehended, guess what? We're going to set a camera up on it. We're going to work it. And we're going to catch that person utilizing that stand, summons them, and uh, take care of the issue. Some landowners, they're, no, no, we just, we don't want the tree stand there. Okay, well, feel free to take it down. You could either leave it there. Some landowners choose to take it down with a note, leave it there and say it's not welcomed. Others like yourself go, you know what? No, 
it's on my property, it's my property, I'm taking it. So those are kind of the options, right? Because what ends up happening is if I take it as a law enforcement officer, it's considered abandoned property. And at that point, I have all these hoops that we jump through. And initially we were doing that. Next thing you know, we have a whole fenced in area down at one of our headquarters that has a 50 tree stands in it that what are we going to do with, right. you know? So at that point, you're going to be asked two questions. Do you want the person caught? If you say yes, we're going to work it and catch the person. If you say no, we're going to advise you, take it down, take care of it yourself, feel free. Um, some landowners have been creative. Instead of taking the tree stand down, they cut the whole tree down. So I don't, <laughs> it's, it's one of those uh, things that uh, really will, will empower you, will either catch the person or empower you to uh, just take it down and, and solve it. And issue. one follow-up. So the, I, I, I've never, it's never happened to me that I've taken one down and got a phone call. No. But um, if I've, I get the question from landowners saying, well, what if I take it down and somebody calls me and says, hey, I'm looking for my tree stand. Is that then, well, is that, I guess I can just give it back or I can say tough luck or I can say, gee, you might want to talk to Dave Shabbat first. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. No, then, those are, uh, those are all options. And at that point we would, uh, I would then of course, like any trespass thing or anything involving landowners, right? I have to essentially confer with you. Hey, do you want this person summons? If you don't want them summons, do you? then I'm going to give them a written warning. Or you can really give them a, hard, a bit of a hard time. It, it, well, I'll give them, give them an education, right? Give them a, a lecture, if, if not, and at least document this one incident and say, hey. Don't come back, don't come back, don't come back with another tree stand. Period. Right. Yep. Yeah, and that, sometimes that's what it takes. Okay. Who else has a question? Steve? Yes, hey, I've, I've got a question. Main, main a wonderful uh, place for the ATV community, the off-highway vehicle community, and uh, a lot of trails and a lot of clubs. And I'd like to hear, Dave, what your experience is working with the main uh, ATV main in particular, but uh, the main ATV club community. And if it's a, if you think it's a, a good, healthy relationship, and and uh, if you're working to uh, advocate for the establishment of more clubs within the state. Yeah, no, Steve, uh, great question. I think um, it's a young group, right? It's a young uh, uh, organization that needs probably a little bit uh, better organizing, better, um, a better front, a better, what I'm seeing is uh, a group of people that are trying very, very, very hard. Some are a lot more successful than others. Um, I look at the Snowmobile Club, right, um, or MSA. They've been around probably since the 50s and 60s. Um, they're heavily involved in landowner relations. They're well organized. They've got a great representation. Um, it's definitely something to mirror. Um, God knows we never expected ATVs and the ATV growth like it is. Seems like we're always behind the eight ball. The state is, the ATV clubs are, um, ATV man. We're always behind the eight ball. Don't ever seem to be able to get out front of and, and, and be proactive. It seems like, unfortunately, we're always reactive because this growth is so um, quick, so strong. I mean, when you think about it in the 80s, right? Or even in the 70s, we had dirt bikes. Then the three wheelers um came out and then next thing you know four wheelers once that four wheel once that quad come out and made it easier for everybody to get outdoors on a wheeler the growth just started to rise from there um what ends up happening the first atv um essentially task force is created because we just can't keep up with um, the enforcement and with the amount of uh, activity that was going on. So we're like, okay, we need to curb that. And that's where that landowner permission came out. Thank God that law came out because that's what forced, um, forced folks to unite and say, hey, we need to form responsible clubs so that we can then engage our landowners as a group and ask for permission to utilize their land. 
So that was a uh, that was a great benefit here in Maine. And but of course that was in what 90, 99 to early two thousand. So it's only been twenty years, and we're still being reactive instead of uh, being proactive. But the clubs are doing better. Um, I look at uh, and I give an example. Uh, a younger club um, out of uh, out of Sanford, out of York County. Um, that those York County clubs that are down there, um, they're doing a good job. I mean that that land down there is a lot of small parcels. There are some larger hundred, couple hundred acre parcels, um, but they're doing a good job with uh, maintaining the amount of people that that place gets utilized uh, from a lot of folks from New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Heavy, 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 heavy ATV use. And uh, those guys are very proactive. Uh, I've found that 99% of the time when a warden contacts a club, uh, whether it be snowmobile or ATV, uh, the president or the trail master is very responsible and is eager and understands the importance to react right away. So um, that's been very beneficial. I have had some instances, and I think that where the trail master is somebody wasn't quite as attentive as they should be <laughs> in uh, after, talking, after talking to the presidents and stuff that individual was either educated on the importance of being attentive and or let go from their position as the trail master and no longer representing the club so clubs have taken a very strong stance they're trying they're only going to get better and again that comes down to those few individuals that are actively participating in the club are dedicated individuals and are really trying to make a difference. So I think we have a lot of growth to do. I think it's a great start. Um, I wish I can implement something that uh, would occur and make everything better right off. I think if we can get some of this legislative stuff through, i.e. the uh, standards in which the trail is gonna be maintained, and whether or not there be proper funding and stuff to do so, um, I think that's going to be a great benefit. And of course, the only way to do that is uh, that money is going to go directly in the ground. And how's it going to get into the ground? It's going to get in the ground by the uh, active ATV clubs. So they do serve a, uh, a huge importance to us and to our landowners that we got to just continue that uh, to support them and help them out when they, uh, when they do reach out. So. Um, that's what we'll continue to do, and hopefully we can get some funding um, to not only benefit the ATV community, but benefit the, the landowners, essentially. So, New Hampshire has successfully implemented a reduced uh, club membership fee um, uh, for folks uh, to, to join and, and, and try and boost club membership, get the right messaging out to the members. It's, it's one of the problems, you know, Maine with its so many clubs and Maine ATVs problems, but um organizationally but um is there do you think that has a chance in the state of maine to to uh to give folks a reduced atv registration fee if they're a club you know i don't know where that's gonna go steve there's uh that's been talked for a long time on both ends the atv clubs and the snowmobile clubs i really don't know where that's gonna go that, that that's something that gets brought up every every uh Every legislative time, every time that um, something like this is talked about, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I don't. I don't see it happening. Um, but at some point, people, we get, we the funding has to come from somewhere, right? So how that funding to maintain those trails come about, we really need to make sure that uh, we come up with a solution because ultimately it's money, right? Whether it's going to be coming from memberships or it's gonna be coming from registrations. How is that funding in gonna come about? So I think that's where it's gonna come down to. All right, are we gonna raise registrations or are we gonna um, make sure everybody has a member of club? I don't know, that, that's something, again, you know, where I suggested earlier, um, people need to talk with their legislatures, you know, their representatives, their senators. They need to keep involved within uh um and be active just don't go and vote that one time in june or in november 
stay involved because that's how your voice is going to be heard. Okay. There is a question from Monica in, the, in our chats. It says, do hunters need my permission to use my land even if I don't have posted signs up? No, no. Maine has that, uh, that traditional open access. We don't have reverse posting here in the state of Maine, meaning if you want to restrict somebody's activities, you would either have to um, post it in accordance to um, Title 17A law that says uh, you have to essentially give somebody notice, whether it be verbally or visually with signs. So if her land is not posted in any way, shape or form, then um, it's considered open access and therefore a hunter, fisherman, dog walker, hiker, they can access her property. So they don't necessarily need permission to carry a gun on the property. They would, however, need permission to either put out any type of coyote bait, bear bait, um, any tree stand, any trail cam, or anything like that. Any of that other items that would require permission, they would uh, still need to inquire. But if they were just essentially going for a walk with their firearm, i.e. hunting, they, uh, they wouldn't need permission. I have a question. Go right ahead. Okay, this is Marty Goldstone. Uh, and I have, I have about 100 acres in Booth Bay and have dealt with ATVs and underage drinking and mobile home dragging. And I have a new issue, which you may or may not be able to give me su su successions for. Um, my land is bordered by a town road and the land is not, the wood has not been able to be thinned in this location because it's either wet or it's too cliffy. And what's happening is the trees are coming down and taking out the power lines. And I'm beginning to think I need to be more proactive. And I wondered if there are anything other than me having to, to hire somebody to thin all of this edge. I'm beginning to feel guilty because it, it's now 23 households that lose their power when, when the line comes down. Okay, Mike. Well, um, first and foremost, have you, hopefully you have an active forester that can assist you in any of that. Uh, remember the towns own a certain, if it's along a public way, the towns own a certain, you might not technically own right up to the tar. The town, depending on the rod width of that road, right, i.e. where the power line, where the pole line is, their property or that public way may extend um, to where these trees are causing a problem. Um, ultimately, CMP usually, if they're having issues in a certain area or Brookfield or whoever your power company is over that way, um, that's very expensive for them. So, um, they usually go and inquire through to the landowner and say, hey, do you mind if we do some thinning? Um, are you, you can have the wood or, hey, are you planning on doing something? So I think if you reached out to uh, um, CMP, uh, the land uh, guy out there, his name is, I believe it's Jim Wright. He just took over position or uh, uh, Brian Burby. Um, those two work at CMP at the Augusta office, and I'm, I'm sure <laughs> if you're giving them permission to help thin that, I'm sure they would, uh, you know, hire a company because I, I can't even imagine what they must spend on the replacement of those lines. Um, but again, if there's, it's hopefully sometime if you have a forester, you'd be able to, you know, go in and, uh, you know, hopefully collect some of that wood. Um, forest service a main forest service. They do, they do have certain programs. Andy Schultz um, is a gentleman out of Augusta. Uh, he's the landowner relations portion for uh, main forest service. Um, you can also reach out to Andy um, through the main forest rangers and see if he can help you out. Um, trees, we don't, we don't necessarily do trees within the the warden service, but those have, those would be the avenues I would probably uh, take. And first and foremost, I'd contact your town first. 
to see how uh, what the width of that public way is. And if it's their problem, then uh, they need they should go and remedy it. So reach out to your town first. If not, contact the uh, Maine Forest Service, um, Andy Schultz, and he should be able to help you out. Yeah, CMP routinely prunes and the town takes care of anything that comes down. I was just trying to be a bit more creative and... <laughs> yeah, usually, so, usually I can't believe CMP just doesn't go and like, uh, I have a spot down here below my road, um, kind of the same thing, big, big, I mean, we're talking 80 to 100 foot pines. And at some point, you know, they, they can only cut so many branches that those big trees are gonna come down. And uh, the CMP has been working there trying to work with the landowner and, and do just that is, all right, let's just, let, let's get rid of these things. They're just causing, they're causing an issue. So right. um, yeah. I, I don't have a quick solution on that one, except yeah. for hopefully it's within the town right away and, and they would be able to, you know, solve the problem. Sometimes, Monty, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So I would talk to talk to your local uh, DOT and say, hey, are you going to solve that problem? <laughs> and hopefully they can do so. Yeah. And tell those 20 something houses that are affected by it to uh, reach out to the, uh, reach out to the local. Because you guys are paying taxes to, for them to uh, make sure those ways are open. Well, with the when mills all closed, there's no logging going on, at least in our area. Can't really, really, yeah. No, we've uh, over here um, in the western portion, we've um, it's picked up quite a bit. So, plus we have the uh, energy uh, wood chip facility over here in the western half of the state as well. Who else has a question? We have about four or five minutes left in our session today. Well, Dave, can you tell us again how to reach you if anybody has any questions after their... Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, my email address is dave.shabot at main.gov. So it's Dave, spelled out, dot, Shabbat, C-H-A-B-O-T, at main, spelled out, dot, gov. And my cell is 207-557-0530. Uh, it's 207 557 -0530. That's my cell phone. Um, and again, uh, yeah, it's uh, anything you need. Like I said, sometimes I have a quick and easy solution and I'll put a smile on your face right then and there. Other times I can give you some sympathy and try to work with you and, and some empathy to see if we can solve your problem. So uh, some are quick and easy fixes. Sometimes others involve uh, um, different activities because again, you know, I'm a law enforcement officer. So blow out the reel? Hello? Oh, oh it's just uh, it's your harness. I see. <laughs> How was it, dear? There we go. Go ahead. Dave. All right. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, but yeah, no. And and if you have any questions, you know, our, our website is mainifnw.gov. And, you know, they, there's some helpful information out there. Um, if you have any suggestions in which I can uh, do a better job or any ideas in which to reach Maine landowners, by all means, um, I'm open up to ideas and thoughts. Um, you know, I, I, I think of some of the stuff that I've received here that I'm going to make mention uh, to my information education department to, to continue the, these types of interactions because I think um, we have to continue to educate. We can never let up on educating the uh, the user front and our landowner front. So it's one of those things that uh, education, conversations, communications can never we can never uh, be be lax on those. We have to make sure we keep pushing that message of respecting our landowners. We're here to help our landowners and. Uh, and in, in, in just keep doing what's right because what we have is very fragile and what we have is of the utmost appointment not only to the state of Maine but to everybody that, that benefits from such uses so again uh, uh, I, I appreciate everybody attending get the word out to your friends your family to anybody that you know um, small groups local community groups uh, I'll go speak to anybody that wants to listen to me so 
um, I appreciate that opportunity. So. Great. Thanks so much for being here today and to uh, have this chat. And we will probably be inviting you back awesome. as the summer progresses and more and more people are out. So awesome. thanks, well, again. thanks to everybody for being here. Uh, we have many more programs coming up in June. Please check our events page on our website at mainwoodlandowners.org and sign up for our next uh, event, which is this Friday, Fireside Civil Culture with um, Bob Seymour. That's been very popular. We've been doing that every month. And we have Tick Talks and um, Chestnut Talks and Forest and Carbon Talks. So we hope to see more, uh, see you folks at our other events. And thanks again for joining us. Have a great rest of your day and a good weekend. Thank you. Well, not yet, but soon. <laughs> All right, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.